Audi. 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 Our, our German friends will learn the language, I'm sure, in short order. It's a, it's a, um, uh, I'm Ryan Crocker, Dean of the Bush School of Government and Public Service here at Texas A&M. And uh, we are delighted to bring you um, a very special program today. Uh, much has been said and written uh, in this country about the, uh, the fall of the wall and the reunification of Germany. Uh, today you're going to hear something slightly different. You will hear from some of the policy makers and architects in the United States uh, uh, how it looked from and worked from our end, uh, but you are also going to hear from uh, a number of very prominent uh, German political figures as to how it looked and worked from their end, uh, as well as figures from elsewhere in Eastern Europe. Um, so today we'll provide a unique perspective uh, uh, on a truly momentous event. Uh, uh, the Scowcroft Institute, headed by Professor Natsios uh, and uh, his terrific team, uh, had the uh, primary role in putting this together. Uh, but I would like to um, recognize two other individuals um, that many of you know, and without which we would not be here today. Um, uh, they are um, Hildegard Buchsein and John Schmitz. Um, uh, my host back in, um, goodness, in February uh, in Germany, uh, where this notion first took place. Um, and I just want to thank both of you for making what we're doing here today possible. <laughs> and with that, I turn it over to Professor Scowcroft, uh, who will get us underway. Andy, thank you. Welcome to the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M University. I am Andrew Natsios, the director of the Scowcroft Institute of International Affairs, which is part of the Bush School, which organized today's event. I would like to thank my deputy, Colonel Don Bailey, Kelly Robbins, and Katie Moore for their organizational skills in bringing this conference to fruition. This conference both commemorates and examines the fall of the Ber Berlin Wall on November 9th, 25 years ago, and the subsequent reunification of Germany and the liberation of Eastern Europe to inform the historical record. Perhaps some new ground will be uncovered today and some historical dispute settled on the events of a quarter century ago. As you entered the Bush Presidential Conference Center this morning, you walked past a statue of horses representing human freedom galloping over actual concrete debris from the Berlin Wall brought here from Germany when the memorial was assembled. So it is particularly fitting that the conference today is being held in front of this remarkable memorial. The German Consul General in Houston a week ago at a concert given by one of my favorite orchestras, the Leipzig Gewandhaus Orchestra at Jones Hall that commemorates the events of 25 years ago, described President George H.W. Bush as the architect of the reunification of Germany with his friend and colleague, the Chancellor of Germany, Helmut Kohl. We have with us today many of the political leaders and their senior staff from Europe and the United States who participated in these historical events and scholars who have written about them. While Chancellor Kohl could not be with us today, two of his closest advisors, Dr. Horst uh, Telchik and uh, Herr Elmer Brock, are here to reflect upon the reunification of Germany. Sebastian uh, Huliban, the former Minister of Defense of Romania, will reflect on the Romanian Revolution and, and its significance for the liberation of Eastern Europe. Sebastian, I hope that's what you're speaking of. <laughs> uh, President and Mrs. Bush will be joining some of the conference, and later this afternoon, the President will receive the Robert Schumann Medal from the European Parliament the highest European award for, and I quote, through their public action and commitment have advanced the causes of peace, European integration, and the values in the service of man, end quote. He will be the first American 
in history to receive this award, which is a measure of the high esteem President Bush has held by today's European leaders. Our Dean, Ryan Crocker, who just spoke, will moderate a conversation at lunch with former Secretary of State Jim Baker and President Bush's National Security Advisor, General Brent Scowcroft, who is here with us this morning. There is another backdrop to the conference today. It is said that nothing in life is assured except death and taxes. I don't know if you say this in Europe, but we say it in the United States. But in the case of the death of empires, while they all do eventually fall, how they fall and when they fall is by no means predictable according to some preordained pattern. In fact, history is driven by human agency, by the capacity of leaders who have the freedom to take and execute decisions, sometimes wisely and sometimes not. The steady, experienced, and restrained hand of President Bush at the helm of state in the United States 25 years ago had a great deal to do with how history unfolded. The former president of Texas A&M and former dean of the Bush School and former secretary of defense, Bob Gates, argued in his first book that President Bush greased the skids on which the Soviet Union gradually slid into oblivion without a war or widespread bloodshed. It is now my pleasure to introduce Elmer Brock, who is the chairman of the Committee on Foreign Affairs of the European Parliament, to open our conference with reflections on these great events. A leader in the Christian Democratic Party of Germany, he has served in the European Parliament since 1980 and is one of the foremost European spokespeople on foreign policy issues and has taken the lead on the European Parliament's response to Russian aggression in the Ukraine. Herr Brock. Thank you, Mr. Natsios, uh, ladies and gentlemen, General Scowcroft, Horst Telchik. I must say I'm a little bit nervous to deliver a speech on this issue in your presence, because you know much more about it than I do. Uh, John Schmidt, uh, Ambassador, Sco uh, Ambassador Grover, ladies and gentlemen. I think uh, this Situation 25 years ago was for many of us a big surprise that it happened at that moment, in that second. And nobody could have said that it would happen at that second. But if you look backwards, we know that this was a process. A process where the free world was very well organized and in a good shape. This is, I think, the very beginning that the West had a strategy, and the presidencies of Reagan and Bush were decisive for that development. I think the cooperation with Helmut Kohl and the double-track decision, the firm position, but at the same time, the, uh, the belief that the Soviet Union is an empire which does not meet our positions on human rights and other questions was at the same time ser taken seriously, and the leaders were taken seriously. And therefore, this way to well be prepared, double track decision, a strong NATO, a European Union which was moving forward with a single act, and so showing that they were able to come closer together and invest one internal market. All that was sti clear pressures, still signals that the West was not giving up. And, uh, I think as Mr. As President Reagan said, 87, before the Brandenburg Gate, Mr. Gorbachev teared down this wall, then that was an important signal. I myself was quite often in the GDR because my wife came from the GDR. She was a refugee. And uh, we had a lot of contact to the people there. And we saw that in this 80s, partly because of the bad economic shape, but especially because of the lack of freedom. Things were moving in the heart of the people there. And we have to know that next to the well-preparedness of the West, we had incredible levers in the East. German European unification, 
would not be possible without Sir Solimano. We should never forget that. Without Lech Walense, Boris Borislav Jeremek, Tadeusz Mosiewski, and especially the Polish Pope. That made a decisive difference. The Charter 77 and Václav Havel in Prague. And in Soviet Union, people like Andrei Sakharov, we should also remember on in these days, who opened debates in incredible courage. It's easy for us to talk about freedom, but for them, it was sometimes a question of death or life, and they did it anyway, because this was a, such a, a positive development. They made, I think, the things different from in inside. And we saw that there was also the economic weakness of the Soviet Union. The communist economic system had failed. This was not able with a command centralized structure to develop an economy which can live in the 20th and 21st century. They were totally living on energy and, uh, and therefore we see the similarities to nowadays. I have sometimes the feeling that the Russian of today is in the same economic situation as the Soviet Union in the 80s. No economic progress and at the same time uh, going down of oil prices, which an incredible impact on their policy. You see that the Comic Con war became too expensive for Moscow. And the reform programs President Gorbachev started showed also that he was not ready to pay anymore, especially the energy bill for his, uh, his satellites. And therefore, the Comic Con summit. I think it was in May 89, was in, uh, of in decisive importance that the Moscow lost control, part of the control on such countries. But we have to see that the economic system as a whole has failed. And I think it uh, has to do that we had at that time, as we called it, the battle of the systems. And it became clear that the West has won the battle of the systems, both economically and politically. It was so that the freedom, the right to travel, the right to get an economic system where you have a progress, the system where not party commands decides about your future, but your ability was decisive for the future. This individual rights all that mixture of that together made a difference. And we have seen revolution so often it came two things together, freedom and bread. Political questions and economic questions which had to come together. And therefore this result was, the result was in the implosion of a system, a very sudden implosion of the system. And here we see also in the GDR a certain question which many people, even especially in Western Germany, have not seen uh, because we read all the articles of the gold medals the GDR won in Olympics. It became a feeling that it was a growing state. We believed in the wrong figures that was, I think, the GDR was pretended to the seventh or the eighth best economic country in the world. We know how wrong that figures all were, but we, uh, many of us started to believe that. I must, myself was a little bit protected always by, by that because of my, the relatives of my wife in East Germany. And uh, there was one important point. And that made me believe in the year 89 more and more that something might happen and unification might be possible. The GDR had never a GDR identity. It was the GDR which was there because of Russian military protection, Soviet Union military protection and the dictatorship. The GDR without Russian ex uh, Soviet Union protection and without dictatorship could not exist because it has not an identity of its own state. And this became very clear as the demonstrations in Leipzig in autumn 89 started with a call, we are the people. 
and then again we are one people, which makes a decisive interest, uh, a difference. And all the tries to change systems were, I think, uh, to stick with the old system, but have more freedom and that had no chance. Then I must say that this development was possible because, and Horst and Gerald Skorkos and James Baker will speak later about it, that we had the right persons there. Pa persons who trusted each other, had confidence to each other. And that, as you said, that is the human agency. I think we had luck that the right teams were there. The Bush team, James Baker, Gerald Scowcroft, and many others. Helmut Kohl, Horst Telching, and many others. And these teams were there who trusted each other. That was my impression. And Gerald Scowcroft, I've read in your book, you have uh, presented together with President Bush as Kohl made his proposal of the 10-point pl uh, plan that was a long discussion whether he has the right to do so. Uh, he said it's not going too far because no full German sovereignty, the rights of the four powers. And you write in that book, in a certain stage, that that was debated in the White House between all the experts. They said, you got the feeling that President Bush has started to trust Helmut Kohl. And I consider that as a decisive moment for German unification which would not have been possible without the United States of America. The United States of America brought, brought freedom twice to Europe, in 45 and 89. And this, I think, is one of the incredible positive and constructive project, perhaps one of the most important things in our developed history. And I believe that on this basis, Larkin came, it became Camp David in February 90. I think we will hear more about it, but also the situations where, if I remember rightly, as Helmut Kohl and Herr Stelchik went, Hans Rieck Genscher went, I think, in February 90 to Moscow, they found a letter of James Baker, who left the day before Moscow, to tell him what was possible and what was achieving. So this close cooperation between that leaders in such moments, which are not normally between independent nations, I think made this point possible. But also, I believe that Helmut Kohl was in all the time clear that leading NATO was never a possible price for German unification. This was very clear, not all from all, but from him it was very clear from the first moment that he will do that. And I think the February and the summer meetings with Gorbachev without that. And I think the success of the two plus four talks would have been only possible because of that. And I believe that also this was decisive that we got our European leaders together. It was so that we were not clear that we had support of all our leaders in Europe. You see the famous checkers meeting Merkel Thatcher organized with all the mistrust on Germany. As I saw that on that day, in the morning in December 89, where the Brandenburg Gate was opened, President Mitterrand still visited the government in East Germany. But I must say that this American support, but also the success of the European unification process was important for that. Because we know in opinion polls that the Brits the British uh, people, the French people, all of them supported with a vast majority of unification. They believe in self-determination because they have learned in the European integration process that this was a new Germany. A Germany based on democracy, on values, the rule of law, which cooperated within European Union and NATO closely with its allies. So in this way, the people in West Germany supported German unification in the beginning more than the some of the leaders in West Germany, which I think was also a proof that this integration process where Helmut Kohl played an important role was 
uh, important way to go forward. I think that this was a situation which made us possible to come to a, a better development, to a better development which made then your unification possible and gave us a possibility for the transformation process which we had to do. The Yom unification was indeed an enlargement of the European Union. And uh, it has all the ingredients of enlargement. And we had to convince our European partners to agree on unification without doing the normal process of enlargement process with negotiations about it, this ratification process in all national parliaments, it would have lasted three to four years to achieve that. And uh, then we know the window of opportunity would have been closed. And uh, therefore, I had myself incredible feelings. Um, it was so that my personal situation at that time as a member of European Parliament, I was when Mr. Secretary General Ruhr to, on the 10th of November to Berlin, the Chancellor came from Warsaw. We had a big rally at the, not that famous at the Schöneburger Rathaus, but at the Gedächtniskirche, where hundreds of thousand people were, especially coming over from East Berlin already. And in the night, I was on the wall before the Bannberg Gate dancing together with the leader of the Christian German Jews, who is now our Minister of Health, Hermann Gröhe. And we brought a machine for printing to a clergyman in East Berlin, Mr. Appelmann, on that were printed the first documents of the First Party Congress, Democratische Aufbruch, where a certain Angela Merkel was a spokesperson. And uh, then, the leader of the EPP in the European Parliament asked me to prepare a resolution with others, with, the lead, with someone from the Social Democrats, on the fall of the wall. And we got a very broad support for that resolution in the European Parliament a few days later. But we were calling in that resolution also as two German authors, one Social Democrats and one me, not just to support German unification but also that this is the moment to unify Europe. That all East European, Central and East European countries who wanted to join have to join. That was a total change of our agenda. A total change of our agenda because nobody had its plans that the European Union would become so, uh, uh, will get so many members. As I started in the European Parliament, we had nine members. Now we have 28. This moment of 1890 brought the possibility to have this European project. This was set up by Robert Schumann, the inventor where the president gets the prize today. In the Schumann plan of 1950, never war again, never dictatorship again. This was the two main reasons for European integration. This was a political project. All what we did afterwards, the single market monetary union, all that were only instruments and are still instruments to keep the nations together to get this goal and live under one legal system. With a joint parliament together with the court of justice whose decisions are binding so give yet a legal entity and make borders within the European Union unimportant. And we have, I think, this success story now. There are 28, the people of 28 countries are not afraid anymore that they would wage war in the near future. What was done in the past of a century is every 20 years. At the heart of the French-German relationship. And I think this also, this Schumann plan was only possible because at that time, Secretary Dean Acheson, forced the French to come up with a proposal how to cooperate with the Germans and overcome the split in the war. So in that beginning, it was an American secretary and before prepared by the Marshall Plan that this was possible and that we were now able 
to have that not only just the Western European bloc, which was also said in the time of the Korean War, uh, to strengthen Western Europe against Soviet Union. It was this now the idea to broaden that to the whole of, to most of our continent, and that we are still in this process to further enlargement to the Western Balkans, but it means also that we have to strengthen our institutional possibilities to make it possible. This was overall very successful. And we had a transformation process that such countries, politically and economically, which was incredible. Still, we have a few countries, still more problems than in others. But in the majority of countries, it was an incredible economic success story in the last 25 years. And it was, I think, because they had, within the European integration process, the European, the, the possibility to become a member of the European Union as a tool for internal transformation. They had this way away from the socialist command economy to a socially orientated market economy, but also the change of the internal system. One of the biggest problems we face is the division of power. The independence of judiciary, which I've learned both in East Germany but also in countries are sometimes even so important than democracy. If we have not an independence of the judiciary system, you will never be able to find corruption. You never will be able to give your people the feeling that they are free people and are protected against the state. We see that again the fight in the, our neighborhood policy in these countries from Ukraine, from Moldova and other countries. How can we strengthen the uh, uh, judicial system that is understood that the law is not the power, the, 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 the might of the powerful against the people, but the right of the people against the powerful? That is our understanding from law. That is the principal question which we have still to achieve in many countries outside the European and a few within the European Union. But overall, we were very successful in the overseas development of the Czech Republic, of Poland, of Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, and many other countries, I must say, we are economically and politically an incredible success story. And uh, we do also not just these legal advices and the legal conditions, and the possibilities of the internal market of the European Union, but we do also help. The European Union gives every year, every year, for weak countries, weak regions, and weak groups within the European Union, 50 billion euros on support, in the regional and social funds, 50 billion euros. It's every year a Marshall Plan of 50 billion euros the European Union gives to its poorer member countries. That is the biggest uh, solidarity program between nations of world history. And we do that also to the neighborhood policy. And until the last program, we gave to the neighborhood countries, eastern neighborhood countries, 70, 70, uh, 7 billion euros. And this time again. And alone, for this Ukraine, the European Union has decided this year to give a support program of 11 billion euros just for Ukraine. That is sometimes in the United States not so much known. And to, to the IMF money, the Europeans give extra their part, which they have to pay for that. And so you see, so here's Western solidarity in a certain way. For Ukraine, it was decided this year if they have the right and the possibility to do the transformation rates of 11 billion euros European program and 17 billion dollars of IMF program. So we should sometimes speak more about it, what that is done, and but also we have to speak that perhaps we should do a better use of that in order to have a positive way. These countries of the neighborhood have a, of Eastern Europe have a European perspective. The former Polish Foreign Minister Sikorski once has said, the countries in the South, North African countries, are neighbors of Europe. The neighbors in the East are European neighbors. And therefore, they have under the Article 49 of the Treaty of Lisbon the right to apply for membership. But I don't know whether they will be any time able for that, to do so because they have sought to fulfill so many conditions nowadays Therefore, we think we do it a step-by-step step thing, and we don't know where we come at the end of the day. But the plan is 
You have now an association and free trade agreement with Moldova, with Georgia, and with the Ukraine. With Moldova and Georgia, we have ratified it, or with Moldova, we will ratify it on Wednesday, with Georgia on the 16th of September. With Ukraine, we did it on the same day, in the same moment. We had a TV transmission between the European Parliament and Ukrainian Parliament as we both uh, put our votes to that in the ratification process. I think it's an incredible development. And we have also to see that the tra same transformation process has to go forward. And we see again this battle of systems is going on. I had the possibility to speak on the Maidan. And when you are in front of hundreds, 60,000 young people, and if they call Europe, demonstrate under European flags, they did not talk about money. They talked about freedom. They want to know that if it's 6 o'clock in the morning, it knocks on their door, it's the man who brings the milk and not the policeman. This is the same thing, the same debate we have again there. And they do not want to be organized by Moscow. And it discusses also with Elchik. Also, I am for a free trade area between Vladivostok and Lisbon. But we have to give the rights to the people in countries like Ukraine, not that the negotiations for them are not done by Moscow, but by for themselves, because they are sovereign nations. I think here they have to make a distinction. And this policy of Eurasian Union, which is a way to control the old countries of the Soviet Union again, is not acceptable. We have to see that we Germans play, have to play an important role in that. The old frontiers of the Soviet Union included the Baltic states, West Poland, and Moldova, what was called before Best Arabia, and Western Ukraine, which was not part of the Soviet Union. It was part of Poland and before Austrian Hungarian Empire. This was the price Hitler paid for Stalin that he couldn't start the First World War. The famous treaty, I think, of the 27th of August of 1939. And when you hear from President Putin that the biggest catastrophe of the 20th century was not a Holocaust, not the two world wars, but the collapse of the Soviet Union. And when I see the argumentation that you hear nowadays sometimes, I have the historical rights, or I have to protect minorities, or I have to meet my security interests, then I become nervous. A Novorossiya policy, which is not just Donetsk and Lugansk and the Crimea, but includes Odessa, comes to Nastristia, we will hear in the next few weeks a lot of things around the elections in Moldova. Then they are at the Danube Delta. I hope that this would be wrong and shown that it would be wrong. But it's still a possibility on the table which we have discussions about. And therefore, we have to remember that the European system was helped with the United States with was and is a European power in the Helsinki Act and later, including the NATO-Russia agreement from 97, that the European relationship of nations is based on three principles of the Helsinki Act, which partly you can find also in the Westphalian peace, which was made 1648 in my home region. It means the sovereignty of equal nations who can have the right to make their decision with whom they make a, a agreement and an alliance. There is not a possibility of near broad and the big powers have a right to decide about their neighbors because of regional interest. The second point is no change of borders without agreement of all stakeholders. This Horst and General Skokrov was two plus four. Two plus four was done to meet this criteria. And uh, the third one is the territory integrity. This has to be met. And we have enough institutions of the OCE, the Council of Europe in Europe, where we can debate that. We will have always conflicts between nations.
But I think we thought we were so good enough that these conflicts can be always solved in peaceful disputes and not any, uh, any more military. And this is, I think, the dangerous and decisive situation that developed of this year, that for the first time, this was not met for decades. And the accession, military accession of Crimea was the first military uh, accession of one part of one country from another country since 1945 in Europe, since 1945. And this we have to take serious. And here we have to give our answer. And that means that we have to get in the renaissance of NATO. Like in the 80s, we have not against someone, we are, but we have to clear with our strategy, and the European Union had no strategy and no energy strategy at all in the last years, which was, and especially no Russia strategy, which was part of the evil, uh, of the evil development, that we have to come to break that. And therefore, it's the Newport NATO decision, an important step to understand and have the practical solution that NATO will be also in the future and, and decisive part of the collective security of Europe. And secondly, that the European Union has to become stronger in security and defense policy. They have done in the last 20 years, 20 years incredible step. But in the last 25 years, we believe that it's eternal peace in Europe and if you look into the st uh, status of our armies, then I try to forget it so fast as possible. But here we have to do more. We have to, have, by a pooling and sharing, by a common procurement, by develop, developing common strategies. The European Union member states give 40% of the defense budget as the United States of Euro America does, but only with 10% of the results because we have not enough cooperation with it. We will not have more money for military purpose in the European in national budgets. But via this cooperation, the synergy effects of this, uh, we can achieve much, much more in order that to strengthen the Western alliance and cooperate in a stronger way in this field. And I believe that might be give us the better possibility in the future both NATO and the European Union to do that. We do not know the final Russian goals. We talked about Moldova. And we do not accept what they have done and what they are doing in this moment. And they have to fulfill the Minsk agreement and the elections were not acceptable in Chidim in the occupied territory. And we know that Ukraine has a legitimation for this policy. They did it in a referendum in the 90s. All parties negotiated with the European Union this negotiation about the association agreement had the agreement of Russia in the 70s as it started in 2007. It is not NATO membership, and there was a change of strategy in Russia. But perhaps also we did not take certain things possible. This, this, uh, 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 even if we do not accept the present Russian policy, we should say that we have to find a way to come to speaking terms again. And here again, President Reagan spoke about the power of the evil, if I remember rightly. But at the same time, he did incredible good in President Bush treaties on uh, against the increase of weapons and disarmament uh, treaties. Do it both. Strengthen ourselves. Make it clear that our system is a system of peace and economic success. But at the same time, to be ready to negotiate and find a way, how can we find a face-saving way for Russia to come back to a policy of common interest? A Russia, which wants to play with China, is a Russia which cannot be a world power anymore. It will be a union partner. And they have done now a, a gas contract with Russia, but they still do have to build the pipelines. And they have negotiated a price which is under, construct, uh, or, or under production cost. That is not the future for Russia. I think to have a better relationship with the rest, West and Russia is for both interests, under the condition that Russia fulfills the conditions of the rule of law, of international law. And I think that's an important point where we have to talk to each other again and find the solutions for that in order to have, make not a, have not a situation of war. Sometimes I'm nowadays a little bit more afraid about an upcoming war than it was before. 
because if I see the internal Russian situation, Secretary General Brezhnev was on, always under control of a Politburo where votes were happening. As a, who is a poli where is the Politburo in the Russia of these days? Do you have a certain control? And that I think this makes me sometimes a little bit nervous. Therefore, I hope that the lessons we learned for our greater success in 89 and 90 of the unification of Germany and Europe should be a model again for closer cooperation in order to have a better future for our nations. Thank you very much.